I want to welcome all of you here uh, to church this morning and uh, all of you who are viewing online. I'm sure that Pastor Victor is probably watching even now, him and Pastor Jamie. So hello, how you doing? What's up? Um, But I am so glad uh, to be inside the house of the Lord with you because I believe that the Lord has um, spoke to my heart. Uh, and led God and directed me by his Holy Spirit on what I'm supposed to say to you today. And I believe we're supposed to talk about reconciliation. I feel like that in the midst of a season and a time right now where there is a lot of unrest, there is a lot of anger and frustration, there is a lot of um, people who had a plan for how, you know, 2020 was going to look and then 2020 punched them in the mouth and people are like, what, what in the world is going on right now? And I believe that people are reacting to just the way that people react. But as Christians, as people of the Lord, we're supposed to react differently to the things that we see going on around us. And the church said, amen. I um, want to give you just by way of kind of an illustration for today, this beautifully painted puzzle piece. Shout out to my girl, Tammy Dodd, for hooking me up. Puzzle pieces. How many of you enjoy puzzles? Yeah, I was looking for some hands there. It's like, nobody! (laughs) Wow, what do y'all do all day? Just sit around and you just watch sermons on YouTube? You so spiritual. Puzzle pieces, they're all different. They're all uniquely shaped. I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to get all the edge pieces first, build there, then jump to the middle. That's the way my brain processes things. They all contain a piece of the overall picture. Mm, yeah, somebody knows where I'm going with this. And they're all needed. Mmm. I don't know if you've ever put together a hundred, two hundred, three hundred piece, maybe even to the thousands piece puzzle. And then you're waiting for that great and glorious moment. And one piece is missing. And you have now turned on your friends and family members saying, it was your fault. I knew you knocked some down earlier. If you have small children, you're convinced that they ate them or flushed it down the toilet. You even have cooked up a conspiracy theory that you got a bad box and the company never even produced this piece and didn't put it inside your puzzle. Because it ain't right if it ain't all put together showing the picture that's supposed to be painted. And I believe we're just like puzzle pieces. Because everybody inside this room and everybody that's watching even here online is different. Even identical twins have a different thumbprint. We're all uniquely shaped. If you look at people on the right and the left of you, you're going to see all kinds of shapes going on. End pieces, middle folks, tall folks, short, all kinds of other shapes. We as people all contain a piece of the overall image that we're looking toward. We have been created in the image of the Lord. And we are all needed. And I say it again, we are all needed. And in the midst of a time when the enemy is trying to drive further wedges between us, we need to be reminded that we're all needed to make the picture. Right? It just wouldn't look right without it. Okay. You get the picture, right? (laughs) We, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Paul is telling the Corinthian church, like, we're all needed. We're all members of the body. And you all have a unique purpose. You can't be looking at other people saying, no, we don't really need that. We need it. We need all the members of the body. 
And I believe this, the enemy realizes that it's in his best interest to try to divide us because a church united is a force that cannot be reckoned with. And I'll say that again. The enemy realizes that a church united is a church, is a force that cannot be reckoned with. He has to try his best to try to divide us. It's his only shot. And unfortunately, we fall prey to the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. But we know his tricks. We know his tactics. Don't be deceived. Don't take the bait of offense. Be reconciled. First to God, then to one another. Reconciliation involves this. It involves a change in the relationship between God and man or man and man. It assumes that there's been a breakdown in the relationship, but now there has been a change from a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of harmony and fellowship. I was asking the Lord, okay, how do we respond to this as men and women of God? How do we respond to this as as Christian people? And the Lord led me to Ephesians chapter 2. And the first 10 verses of that chapter is all about us first being reconciled to God. The latter half of that chapter is all about us being reconciled to each other. Because you'll never get to being reconciled with each other if you ain't first reconciled to the Lord. One reason why I believe that it, 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 it gets in our way of being reconciled to God is because we don't realize what we've truly been saved from. The first part of chapter 2 and verse, verse 1 says, And you were dead, everybody say dead, and your trespasses and sins. And even down into verse 5, it says it again. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, and we have a, a wrong view of what dead actually means. We think that we were kind of floundering on top of the water, and we had gotten tired of treading water. And Jesus, in his great and ultimate mercy, reaches down and says, get up out of this water. You don't have to drown. And we're all excited. Yeah. But the real picture of what dead looks like is that we're not on top of the water floundering. We're under the water. And not just a little bit under the water. I'm talking about deep now, enough in the water where it's dark and we can't see our hand in front of our face. And that's not even really deep enough to give you a picture of what dead really looks like because we're on the bottom of the ocean floor. And that's not even really a good enough picture of what dead looks like. We're through the ocean floor, underneath the miry clay, and there your dead, lifeless, helpless body that could not do anything to save itself lie there without hope. And Jesus, being, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. So he reaches down from heaven through the ocean, through the muck and the mire of the clay, and he picks us up and he sets our feet upon a rock and he breathes the breath of life on the inside of us. And that is the picture of what we once were and what we are now. And the church said, amen. You've been saved from something really, really bad. And God in the richness of his mercy has given you something really, really good. But we miss that sometimes. We miss what we've truly been saved from. I I, I, I describe it to my young people sometimes as this. You're treating God like he's that boy or that girl who really, really likes you, but you don't really, really like them. But you don't want to tell them that because you want to keep them around enough to just kind of, just in case, you might need them. Don't treat God like that so much more because he saved us. He saved us. And it's a great and a glorious salvation. I've seen people post this verse of Scripture a a lot over the last several weeks because I believe that people are, I believe the Lord's turning hearts toward himself. I believe he's using the things that is happening right now to save souls. I I saw somebody post a, a, a particular thing that they were frustrated at the service that they got at the Galleria this week. And so they wound up leaving. And 
course, a little bit after that, we saw that there was a shooting there, and I thought, look at potentially what God was doing there. Maybe he used an outside set of circumstances to get you out of harm's way. Because God, rich in his mercy, is reaching out. Amen? And people are asking, search me, oh God, know my thoughts. Test me, know my, know, my, know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me. Because what I believe is this. It's a, it's a serious thing. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. If you're not reconciled to God, there's coming a point where you may think that you're right, but you ain't right. Because the Lord says that many will come to him that day and say, Lord, Lord. Didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name didn't we cast out devils? In your name didn't we do many uh, wonderful works? I never knew you. But I showed up to church. But I did all the stuff. But, y- y- you know, I-, I even invited some people. But you weren't reconciled to God. A reconciliation involves two parties coming together. God has granted his, his forgiveness towards you. But for whatever reason, it hasn't really made sense for you. And I, 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 I put it together like this, that what the world needs right now is real, sold out, passionate believers who believe what this book says. Because if those people would begin to rise up, amen, not just the ones showing up. I'm convinced that uh, one of the greatest statistics that I hear on a regular basis is that young people are walking away from the faith after uh, years in youth group and years of going to church. Why? Because no one's ever challenged them on what they believe and why they believe it. Then they get inside a college classroom and they're like, oh, da, da, da. But I've been going to church all these years. I'm telling you, you got to make sure, which is why we got to live in this constant state of search me, oh God, know my thoughts, see if there be any offensive way in me. I mean, I want to stay close to you. I want to be reconciled to you, Father God. But as I say a very intense statement like that, I don't want to leave you by yourself in that. Matthew 11, chapter 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are labor, labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle, lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You don't have to walk around feeling like, I'm not good enough. I'm not great enough. I'm not doing enough. If that's what you're feeling, that's not from God. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. It's simple. Those who love God keep his commands. The gospel is beautiful in its simplicity. And the church said, amen. For it is by grace that you have been saved. This is all in Ephesians chapter 2. These, these first about 10 verses, all about being reconciled to God because if you never make it there. You never make it to what, what's really going on in our world right now. This, this is reconciliation with one another. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doings. It's a gift from the God, not a result of works. Everybody say works. I have a fitness goal this year that I would like to run a half marathon. Most of my life I have ran, worked out, been involved in sports, that sort of thing. And I've always had good motivation, you know, for that. My motivation for nutrition has been goose egg. I run and work out so that I can have a half gallon of bluebell strawberry ice cream. I'm justifying this, baby. I want all that Edgar strawberry cake and lemon meringue pie from Edwards because... So, I mean, you know, you you start to kind of measure out, you know, like, okay, well, this piece of pie is probably what? Jason, what do you think? 30 minutes of exercise? Maybe a mile and a half? And I never, at least two, at least two. I never would get the fitness goals, you know, that I had set forth. You know, I want, you know, I don't know, cut up, you know, this is 
six pack. Because I'm just eating whatever. And I'm just trying to run to make up for it. If you listen to anybody talking about how you really get in shape, it's all nutrition for the most part. I hear people saying, I cut out soft drinks and I lost 12 pounds. I ain't eating bread and sugar no more and the weight's just falling off. Yeah, because bread and sugar's great. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and the church said amen. You, the reason why I say that is because I believe that's what we do sometimes as Christians. And we just get a bunch of spiritual activity going. And we think that makes up for that we ain't had no intake of this all week. But I've been going to church. But I've been like serving. Man, I got like two solos. I got to be like, I'm doing it big, man. You can't do spiritual activity that makes up for your intake. You got to do intake. So that you can't go around and say, I got perfect attendance. Even during this pandemic, baby, I hadn't missed one service. Matter of fact, I keep coming in the parking lot and I watch it from the parking lot. Because <laughs> I want the extra credit that God gives. It is not a result of your own works. It's a gift from God. Be reconciled to God not because of anything that you're doing, but because you finally get it. God, you, you love me. You granted me this gift. Amen? Now you can move to this being reconciled one to another. In that back half of Ephesians chapter 2, the Jews and the Gentiles, Paul's reminding the church at Ephesus like, hey, Jews and Gentiles, y'all didn't used to get along. And some of y'all that were Gentiles... Before this, or some of y'all Gentiles need to know that God has brought you together. You're not at odds anymore. Why well, the reason I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles, and a Gentile is just a non-Jew? Because if God can bring together Jews and Gentiles, he can bring us together. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 says this therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands what being uncircumcised was kind of a derogatory term back in the day you'll remember that when David comes out talking trash to Goliath First thing that flies out of his mouth is, you uncircumcised Philistine, come get some, baby. <laughs> this is a little bit of the Philip translation on the back end of that. It's a derogatory thing. And Paul's telling them, hey, Gentiles, check this out. <laughs> Uncircumcision in the flesh, that was a pretty rough thing, but you have been circumcised by the Spirit. Remember that at one time you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. How does that uh, uh, translate to us? Hey, man and woman of God, you hadn't always been a Christian. You hadn't always been saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost and God. So when you read a post from someone or you have a conversation with someone, you grant them the same allowance that the Holy Spirit gave you in coming to know Christ. You've forgotten, church, that there was once a separation. You were once without hope too. People with no hope respond like people with no hope. And people with hope respond differently. Amen? But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, obviously, there's different pigmentation, and I got a little bit higher count of melanin than some of y'all inside this room. But I believe when the Lord looks down, he's not looking at melanin count. I believe he's looking at who's covered by the blood. 
Amen. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 says this. For he himself is our peace, not that he grants us peace. He is our peace. You having problems with uh, 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 another believer, another, another person in the faith? God is the peace. Somebody outside of the faith, when it is at all possible with you, live at peace with one another. That's what Scripture says. Yeah, but... I don't know, I mean, you find something else. That's what this book says. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There was a wall in the temple. And Gentiles could only go so far. Jesus gets rid of the wall and joins them together by the blood of Christ. And he abolishes the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances. Jesus fulfills the law. Doesn't get rid of it, he fulfills it. Continues the moral law that's written on the, the, the hearts of all of us, representing the Ten Commandments. We all know it's wrong to steal. We all know that there's a problem with killing. We, we, we all get that. That he might create in himself one new man in the place of two. I'll read back to you again what, what Jesus does for Jews and Gentiles, these people who have been odd, at odds for years and years and years and years. He himself creates one new man in, in the place of two, creating peace and reconciling us to God. In one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. I don't know, I don't know. You ain't, I mean, have you even seen one? One in Christ. One in Christ. We respond differently. Love this as I was just searching through Ephesians. And I'm, I'm just gonna tell you this. I used to hear people back in the day, they used to just talk about how much they love scripture. Oh, I got, a, I got something from scripture today. Oh, I was just reading from scripture today. I used to hear um, uh, Sarah talk about this all the time. And she would talk about how she was just sitting on her couch and just enjoying scripture. And scripture for me was broccoli or really vegetables in general. I knew it was a good thing and I did it, but enjoying it took a while. But can I tell you this? I, I prayed, I prayed to the Lord to give me a love for scripture so I could have what these people say. Oh, I just... <sighs> And that may sound like a fairy tale to some of you, like, oh, I gotta read again, study again, I'm done with school. <sighs> okay, God, what are you saying today? Okay, Hosea's wife and children, now what are you saying about that? You know, I'm telling you, if you pray, the Lord will give you a love for his word. I say that because as I've been studying scripture, I was reminded like, Man, I didn't used to get like this. But I was studying scripture this week. And I found something and it just jazzed me up. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, 26, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger all my life. I've heard people preach that in conjunction with marriage. Hey, don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Y'all got to make up before, before you go to sleep. You know, in, in my short time of being married, I have learned that some nights it's good to go to sleep. Sleep this one off, try again in the morning. Just, just, you know what? Today just wasn't our day. We're going to, tomorrow, Lord willing, the creek don't rise, we're going to try this again. Paul's not talking to married folks there. Now, he's talking to married people because they're included in the church. He's talking to the church. Now, 
catch that understanding as you read it again. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. I don't know how many of you over the last several weeks and maybe months have read something, saw something, had a conversation with somebody and you're ready to write people off. You're ready to get rid of folks. Ready to just, I'm done. I don't care who I lose. I'm just saying it. God's called us in his word that if we have enmity with each other, we're supposed to drop our sacrifice, go and make things right. It's important for us not to necessarily win the argument. We want to win our brother, according to Matthew 18. Yeah, but I'm right. Yeah, but I think God's called us to be liked. Mm-hmm. 4 and 27 through 32. I'm going to just skip right down to verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgave you. Yeah, but you don't know what they said. Yeah, but they're, they're posting just ridiculous junk. Somebody's. Somebody's got to say something. I don't know who badged you as junior Holy Spirit and you need to go and now just do. I feel like the Holy Spirit can still do his job, especially if they're a believer. Hmm. We reconcile with the gospel. So uh, we, we first reconcile uh, be reconciled to God. We, we're reconciled to each other. Okay, what does that look like? What is the practical application of that in, in, inside our lives? The gospel. There's people who uh, um, are bad, are, are rough, are without the Lord. If you want to make something loud, if you want to scream something at them, scream at them that God, in the richness of his mercy, sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross on their behalf. And Jesus, before he went back up to heaven, did not leave us down here alone. He left the precious Holy Spirit to give us boldness, to, to give us comfort, and to walk with us throughout this life. That's what you can scream at them. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 18. So uh, at the end of Ephesians, Paul, you know, he's, he goes through the whole spiritual warfare thing. Uh, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, belt of truth, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're leading, we're walking with that peace because we're at war. Now, if you hadn't seen the same news cast that I've seen and some of the same posts on social media that I've seen, People are ready for war. Pulling out guns and, you know, saying that I'll do this to you if you say this or do that to me. And that's deep down on the inside of each and every person. You were created for war, just not the type of war that we sometimes see played out in our newscast. You were created for spiritual war because our battle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities. And the way that we do that is through praying at all times in the spirit with prayer and supplication. And to that end, we keep alert with all perse perseverance, making supplications for all of the saints. I don't want to pray for them. That's the war right there. Dealing with that and choosing to pray for those who you don't want to pray for. Can I give you a story really quickly? There have been people in my life, and I haven't experienced this much, and I'm not going to uh, belabor this point long, but there have been people in my life who treated me differently 
because of the melanin in my skin. And I believe that one of the most awesome things that the Spirit of the Lord's ever done inside me is respond to them in love and truth and then win them over in the name of Jesus. I could have flipped a table. I could have cussed them out. I could have gotten rid of them. I could have told everybody about, I could have just screamed and yelled. But I've won my brother. And I believe that's the great and the glorious call of the church. Amen? And so I leave you with this. Jesus is going and he's going to be brought before the governmental leaders. He's going to be crucified because the crowd's saying, crucify, 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 crucify. We're done with this Jesus. Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Pilate stands up and he says, this, your king? You want, he's not our king. Crucify him. Here's a little trivia time. Does anyone in the room know what Barabbas' first name is? Shane, you got this trivia, man? Does anybody know? Scream it out, really. Do you know what Barabbas' first name is? Jesus. So check this out. The people of God, they wanted a Jesus who was going to lead a revolt against the Roman government. They were done. They wanted someone who was going to take the kingdom by force. They wanted someone who was going to lead a revolt. So my question for you today is, and how you walk this out in, in practical application in life, is which Jesus do you want? You want Jesus Barabbas? The insurrectionist? The murderer? The leader of the revolt? Or will you respond differently like Jesus the Christ? Even when Jesus the Christ doesn't react how we feel like should be handled in that situation, Jesus responded differently. Which Jesus do you want? Because what the people of God decide will be how we proceed forward. The enemy cannot handle us together. He can't. That is why his only move is to try to divide us. Don't be divided. Don't be divided. Reconcile first to God reconcile next to each other and walk that out through the practical application of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Let that be the loudest thing that you say. If people are going to accuse you of anything, let them accuse you of being so gospel-centered that all you do is tell them of the hope that you have and the hope that they can have. Amen? Amen. I'm going to speak some scripture over you and then I'm going to ask you to stand. And just like any other Sunday here, if you do need prayer about anything uh, that's going on inside your life, me as well as uh, others will be here to pray with you and for you. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 3 says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, and now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. That's my prayer for you today. I want you to stand with me.
We're all different. We're all uniquely shaped. We all have an image of the creator on us. We're all needed. And together we can make the beautiful picture that God has called us to be. And I pray that even in the midst of a global pandemic, even in the midst of all kinds of civil unrest, that the people of God would not forget who we are called to be. That we would follow Jesus no matter what. No matter what our emotions say, no matter what our feelings dictate, that our spirit dictates to our flesh. Amen. Um, there will be ushers on your way out if you do need to give. But I want to pray a blessing over you. And again, I'll be up here if you do need special prayer about anything. So with everybody looking at me with eyes wide, wide open, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and grant you peace for you. And you're the blessed of the Lord. You're blessed going in and you're blessed going out. Just as our pastor says every week, I want you to leave this place. Be light and transform this community. Amen. I love you. See you next week.